before we get started, I just want to say copyright 2007 Mimic Kid Inc. I own no rights to his book. All the rights go to Jeff Kinney and stuff. And also for Aimlet for publishing the book, I guess, too. Uh, the only thing I own is the recording, which I'm not even sure if I own that because I'm re just reading the book. <laughs> so, uh, if anybody uh, at maybe Kid Inc. or Aimlet or Jeff Kinney himself, I've met him before, so I'm not, I'm, he probably won't mind this being up, but like, anybody of that uh, wants to sit down, just contact me uh, or something. I don't know. Anyways, so let's get on to the book. Diary of a Rippy Kid by Jeff Kinney Narrated by Flag098 September Tuesday First of all, let me get something straight. This is a journal, not a diary. I know what it says on the cover, but when Mom went out to buy this thing, I specifically told her to get one that didn't say Dowry on it. Great. All I need is for some joke to catch me carrying this book around and get the wrong idea. The other, uh, Sissy. The other thing I want to clear up right away is that this was Mom's idea, not mine. But if she thinks I'm going to write down my feelings in here or, or whatever, she's crazy. So just don't expect me to be our dear Dowry this and dear Dowry that. The only reason I agreed to do this at all is because I figure later on, when I'm rich and famous, I'll have better things to do than answer people's stupid questions all day long, so this book's gonna come in handy. I do not want them saying, Whoa, tell us about your childhood. You really always so smart and handsome, because you can just find it in my journal. Like I said, I'll be famous one day. But for now, I'm stuck with middle school with a bus bunch of morons. Let me just say for the record that I think middle school is the dumbest idea ever invented. You got kids like me who haven't hit the growth spot yet mixed in with these gorillas who need to shave twice a day. And then they run away bullying such a big problem in middle school. If it was up to me, grade levels would be based on height, not age. But then again, I guess that mean kids like Shoah Gupta would still be in the first grade. Today is the first day of school, and right now we're just running around with the teacher to hurry up and finish the scene and chart, so I figured I might as well write in this book to pass the time. By the way, let me give you some good advice. On the first day of school, you've got to be real careful where really you sit. You walk into the classroom and just plunk your stuff down on any old desk, and the next thing you know, the teacher was saying, I hope you are all like really sitting because these are now your permanent seats. So in this class, I got stuck with Chris Hosey in front of me, and Lionel James in back of me. Jason Brill came in late and almost sat to my right, but luckily I stopped that from happening at the last second. He said, is this suit you taking? And I said, yes, yes. Next period, I should just sit in the middle of a bunch of hot girls as soon as I step in the room. But I guess if I do that, it just proves I didn't learn anything from last year. I passed letters that said Greg is a dog. Man, I don't know what is up with girls these days. It used to be a whole lot simpler back in elementary school. The deal was, if you were the fastest runner in your class, you got all the goals. And in the fifth grade, the fastest runner was Ronnie McCoy. Nowadays, it's a whole lot more complicated. Now it's about the kinds of clothes you wear, or how rich you are, or if you have a cute butt, or whatever. And kids like Ronnie McCoy are scratching their heads, wondering what the heck happened. The most popular, go the most popular boy in my grade is Bryce Anderson. The thing that I really stinks is that I've always been into girls, but kids like Bryce has only come around in the last couple of years. I remember how Bryce used to act back in elementary school, saying girls are stinky poos, but I would respond back, I do not think girls are stinky poos. But of course, now I don't get any credit for sticking with the girls all this time. Like I said, Bryce is the most popular kid in our grade, so that leaves all the rest of us guys scrambling for the other spots. 
the best I can figure out is that I'm somewhere around 52nd or 53rd most popular this year. But the good news is that I'm about to move up one spot because Charlie Davis is above me and he's getting his faces next week. I tried to explain all this popularity stuff to my friend Riley, who is probably hovering right around the 150 mark by the way, but I think he just goes in one ear and out the other with him. Wednesday. Today we had phys ed, so the first thing I did when I got outside was sneak off to the basketball court to see if the cheese was still there, and sure enough it was. That piece of cheese had been sitting on the black to top since last spring. I guess it must have dropped out of someone's sandwich or something. After a couple of days, the cheese started getting all moldy and nasty. Nobody would play basketball in the coat where the cheese was, even though that was the only coat that had a hoop with a net. Then one day, this kid named Darren Watch touched the, touched the cheese with his finger, and that's what started this thing called the cheese touch. It's basically like the cookies. If you get the cheese touch, you're stuck with it until you pass it on to someone else. The only way to protect yourself from the cheese touch is to cross your fingers. But it's not that easy of remembering to keep your fingers crossed at every moment of the day. I ended up taping mine together so they'd stay crossed all the time. I got a Dean Hain writing, but it was totally worth it. This one kid named Abe Haw got the cheese touch in April, and nobody would even come near him for the rest of the year. This summer, Abe moved away to California and took the cheese touch with him. I just hope Sony doesn't start the cheese touch up again, because I don't need that kind of stress in my life anymore. Thursday. I'm having a seriously hard time getting used to the fact that summer is awful and I have to get out of bed every morning to go to school. My summer did not exactly get off to a great start, thanks to my, old, thanks to my older brother Roderick. A couple of days into summer vacation, Roderick woke me up in the middle of the night. He told me I slept through the whole summer, but that luckily I woke up just in time for the first day of school. You might think I was pretty dumb for falling for that one. But Roderick was dressed up in his school clothes and he set my alarm clock ahead to make it look like it was in the morning. Plus, he closed my coning so, so I couldn't see that it was still dark out. After Roderick woke me up, I just got dressed and make, went downstairs to make myself some breakfast like I could do every morning on a school day. But I guess I must have made a pretty big racket because the next thing I knew, Dad was downstairs yelling at me for eating Cheerios at 3 in the morning. After all, it took me a minute to figure out what the heck was going on. After I did, I told Dad that Roderick had played a trick on me, and he was the one that should be getting yelled at. Dad walked down to the basement to chew Roderick out, and I tagged along. I couldn't wait to see Roderick get what was coming to him. But Roger covered up his tracks really pretty good. And to this day, I'm sure Dad thinks I got a screw loose or something. Friday. Today at school, we got assigned to reading groups. They don't come right out and tell you if you're in the gifted group or the easy group, but they can figure it out right away by looking at the covers of the books they hand out. I was pretty disappointed to find out that I got put in a gifted group. Because that just means a lot extra of extra work. When I did this screening at the end of the last year, I did my best to make sure I got put in the easy group this year. Fred picked up the b b b b the book. Ooh, thanks. Mom is real tight with our principal, so I bet she stepped in and made sure I got put in the gifted group again. Mom is always saying I'm a smart kid, but just that I just don't apply myself. But there's one thing I learned from Modric is, is to set people's expectations real low so that you end up surprising them by basically doing nothing at all. Modric, I want your dirty underwear off the kitchen table before I get home from work. And then later, when you get home from work, the underwear is off and Dad is surprised. Actually, I'm kind of glad my plan to get put in the easy group didn't work. 
I saw a couple of the bank says boo kids holding the books upside down and I don't think they were joking. Bank says boo kids are the, uh, the, the easy groups. Saturday. Well, the first week of school is finally over, so today I slept in. Most kids wake up early on Saturday to watch cartoons or whatever, but not me. The only reason I get out of bed at all on weekends is because eventually I can't stand the taste of my own breath anymore. Unfortunately, Dad wakes up at 6 o'clock in the morning no matter what day of the week it is, and he's not real considerate of the fact that I'm trying to enjoy my Saturday like a normal person. I didn't have anything to do today, so I just headed up to Riley's house. Riley's technically my best friend, but that is definitely subject to change. I've been avoiding Riley since the first day of school, when he did something that really annoyed me. We were getting our stuff from our lockers at the end of the day, and Riley came up to me and said, Want to, want to come over to my house and play? I have to tell Riley at least a billion times that now that we're in middle school, you're supposed to say hang out, not play. But no matter how many nuggets I give him, he always forgets the next time. I've been trying to be a lot more careful about my image ever since I got to middle school, but having Riley around is definitely not helping. I met Riley a few years ago when he moved into my neighborhood. His mom brought, bought him this book called How to Make Friends in New Places, and he came to my house trying all these scum dumb gimmicks. Knock knock. Huh? Thomas? Excuse me? Thor must be some way to tickle your funny bone. Say what? I guess I'm kind of felt sorry for Riley, and I decided to take him under my ring. It's been great having him around, mostly because I get to use all the tricks Roderick pulls on me. Did you know that if your hand is bigger than your face, it's a sign of low intelligence? Really? And then I slap his face when he puts his hand up to his face. But do I have low intelligence? Hmm. Let me check again. Monday. You know how I said I play all sorts of pranks on Rally? Well, I have a little brother named Manny, and I could never get away with pulling any of that stuff on him. Mom and Dad protect Manny like he's a prince or something, and he never gets in trouble, even if he really deserves it. Yesterday, May drew a self-portrait on my bedroom door in permanent Marco. I thought Mom and Dad were really going to let him have it, but as usual, I was wrong. But the thing that bugs me the most about Manny is the nickname he has for me. When he was a baby, he couldn't pronounce brothel, so he started calling me Bubby. And he still calls me that now, even though I keep trying to t get Mom and Dad to make him stop. Luckily, none of my friends have found out yet, but believe me, I'd have some pretty close calls. One time around both day, one of my friends said, Hey, this one's this is to Bubby. And then I said, Must be a mistake, and threw in the trash. Mom makes me help Manny get ready for school in the morning. After I make Manny his breakfast, he carries his cereal bowl into the family room and sits on his plastic potty. C is for cooking and cookies for me. And when it's time for him to go to daycare, he gets up and dumps whatever we did eat right in the toilet. Mom is always getting on me for not finishing my breakfast, but if she had to scrape cone flakes out of the bottom of a plastic potty every morning, she wouldn't have much of appetite evil. Tuesday. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I am super good at video games. I bet I could beat anybody in my grade head to head. Unfortunately, Dad does not exactly appreciate my skills. He saw his skin on me about going out and doing something active. So t tonight after dinner, when Dad started hassling me about going outside, I tried to explain how with video games, we could play sports like football and soccer, and you don't even get all hot and sweaty. But I used to use little, Dad didn't see my logic. Dad is a pretty smart guy in general, but when it comes to common sense, sometimes I wonder about him. 
I'm sure Dad would dismantle my game system if he could figure out how to do it. But luckily, the people who make these things make the parent, parent proof. Every time Dad kicks me out of the house to do something sporty, I just go up to rallies and play my video games there. Unfortunately, the only games I can play at rallies are car racing day games and stuff like that. Because whenever I bring a game up to rallies house, his dad looks it up on some parent's website. If my game has any sort of fighting or, f or violence in it, he won't let us play. I'm getting a little sick of playing Formula 1 Racing Rally because he's not a serious gamer like me. All that you have to do is to beat rallies, name your car something ridiculous at the beginning of the day in the game. Then, and then when you pass rally's car, he just falls to pieces when they s say, bad fought ahead. Anyway, after I get done mopping the floor with rally today, I headed home. I ran through the neighbor's sprinkler a couple of times to make it look like I was all sweaty, and that seemed to do the trick for Dad. But my trick kind of backfired, because as soon as Mom saw me, she made me go upstairs and take a shower. Wednesday I guess Dad must have been pretty happy with himself for making me go outside yesterday, because he did it again today. It's getting really annoying to have to go up to rallies every time I want to play a video game. There's this weird kid named Fregley who lives halfway between my house and Rally's, and Fregley is always hanging out in his front yard, so it's pretty hard to avoid him. Wanna see my secret freckle? Um, no thanks. Fregley is in my phys ed class at school, and he has this whole made up language. Like when he needs to go to the bathroom, he says, JUICE! JUICE! Us kids have pretty much figured Fregley out by now, but I don't think the teachers have really caught on yet. Uh, my gym teacher keeps bringing him juice whenever he says that. Okay, kid, cheat this. Today, I probably would have gone up to rallies on my own anyway, because my brother Roderick and his friend were practicing down in the basement. Roderick's friend is really awful and I can't stand being home when they're having rehearsals. His band is called Loaded Diaper, only spelled L-O-D-E-D-D-I-P-E-R on Roderick's fan. You might think he spelled it that way to make it look cooler, but I bet if you told Roderick how Loaded Diaper is really spelled, it would be news to him. That was against the idea of Roderick starting a band, but Mom was all for it. She's the one who brought Roderick his first drum set. I think mom has this idea that we're all going to learn to play instruments and then become one of those family bands like you'll see on TV. Dad really hates heavy metal and that's the kind of music Roderick and his band play. I don't think mom really cares what Roderick plays or listens to because to her all music's the same. In fact earlier today Roderick was listening to one of his CDs in the family room, and Mom came in and started dancing. That really bugged Roderick, so he drove off to the store and came back 15 minutes later with some headphones, and that pretty much took care of the problem. So stay. Yesterday, Roderick got a new heavy metal CD, and it had one of those parental warning stickers on it. I have never gone to listen to one of those parental warning CDs because mom and dad never let me buy them at the mall. So I realized the only way I was going to get a chance to listen to Roderick's CD was if I snuck it out of the house. This morning, after Roderick left, I called up Rally and told him to bring his CD player to school. Then I went down to Roderick's room and took the CD off his rack. You're not allowed to bring personal, personal music players to school, so we had to wait until you sit until after lunch when the teachers let us outside. As soon as we got the chance, me and Riley snuck around the back of the school and loaded up Roderick's CD, but Riley forgot to put batteries into his CD player, so it was pretty much worthless. Then I came up with this great idea for a game. The object was to put the headphones on your head and try to shake them off without using your hands. 
The winner was whoever could shake the headphones off in the shortest amount of time. I had the record of seven and a half seconds, but I think I might have shook some of my phone sleeves with that one. Right in the middle of the game, Mrs. Craig came around the corner and caught us red-handed. She took the music player away from me and started chewing us out. But I think she had the wrong idea about what we were doing back there. She started telling us how rock and roll was evil and how it was going to ruin our brains. I was going to tell her that there wasn't even any batteries in the CD player, but I could tell she didn't want to be interrupted, so I just waited until she was done and then I said, yes ma'am. But right when Mrs. Craig was about to let us go, Riley started blubbering about he doesn't want rock and roll to ruin his brains. Honestly, sometimes I don't know about that boy. Friday. Well, now I've gone and done it. Last night, after everyone was in bed, I snuck downstairs to listen to Roswick's CD on the stereo in the family room. I put Roswick's new headphones on and cranked up the volume really high, so then I hit play. Folks, let me just say I can definitely understand why they put that parental warning sticker on the CD. But I only got to hear about 30 seconds of the full song before I got interrupted. It turns out I didn't have the headphones plugged into the stereo, so the music was actually coming through the speakers, not the headphones. Dad marched me up to my room and shut the door behind him, and then he said, Let's you and me have a talk, friend. When I thought Dad says friend that way, you know you're in trouble. The first time Dad ever said friend like that to me, I didn't get that he was being sarcastic, so I kind of let my guard down. I f thought that friend is good. I don't make that mistake anymore. Tonight, Dad yelled at me for about 10 minutes, and then I guess he decided he'd rather be in bed than staying in my room in Sunderwell. He told me I was grounded from playing video games for two weeks, which is about what I expected. I guess I should be glad that's all he did. The good thing about that is that when he gets mad, he cools off real quick, and then it's all full. Usually, if you mess up in front of Dad, he just throws whatever he got in his hands at you. A good time to screw up when he's reading the paper, and a bad time to screw up when he's holding bricks. Mom has a totally different style when it comes to punishment. If you mess up and Mom catches you, the first thing she does is to take a few days to figure out what your punishment should be. And while you're winning, you do all these nice things to try to get off easier. I just dusted the dining room for the heck of it. How thoughtful of you. But then after a few days, right when you forget you're in trouble, that's when she lays it on you. Are you having fun? Yeah. No video games for a week. Monday. This video game band is a whole lot tougher than I thought it would be, but at least I'm not the only one in the family who's in trouble. Roderick's in some hot water with Mom right now, too. Maybe got a hold of one of Roderick's heavy metal mag magazines, and one of the pages had a picture of a woman in a bikini laying across the hood of a car, and then Manny brought it into daycare for show and tell. Anyway, I don't think Mom was too happy about getting that phone call. I saw the magazine myself, and it honestly wasn't anything to get woked up over, but Mom doesn't allow that kind of stuff in the house. Roderick's punishment was that he had to answer a bunch of, crunch, bunch of questions Mom wrote out for him. Did owning this magazine make you a better person? No. Did it make you more popular at school? No. How do you feel about having owned this type of magazine now? I feel ashamed. Do you have anything you want to say to women for having owned this offensive magazine? I'm sorry, woman. Wednesday. I'm still grounded from playing video games, so Manny's been using my system. Mom went out and bought a whole bunch of educational video games and watching Manny play them is like torture. 
What number comes after two and rhymes with the tree? It means like, hmm. Well, I yell out, three, three. The good news is that I finally figured out how to get some of my games past Riley's dad. I just put one of my discs in Manny's Discover in the alphabet case, and that's all it takes. Thursday. At school today, they announced that student government elections are coming up. To be honest with you, I never had any interest in student government. But when I started thinking about it, I realized getting elected treasurer to totally change my situation at school. We cheerleaders are just tired of finding two games in the same bus as the notes in the band. Hmm, let me see what I can do. And I can get them a limbo. And even better, we jocks just need an ill pump to inflate our only football. Yeah, sorry, can't help you with that. Nobody ever thinks about running for treasurer because all people ever care about are the big ticket positions like president and vice president. So I figure if I sign up for tomorrow, the treasurer got the job is pretty much mine for the taking. Friday. Today, I went and put my name on the list to run for treasurer. Unfortunately, this kid named Marty Pato is running for treasurer too. And he's real brainy at math, so this might not be as easy as I thought. I told dad that I was running for pres student government, and he seemed pretty excited. Yeah. It, turned out, it turns out he ran for student government when he was my age, and he actually won. Dad dug through some old boxes in the basement and found one of his champagne posters. Integrity, honesty, know-how. Vote Frank Heffley for secretary. I thought the poster idea was pretty good, so I asked Dad to drive me to the store to get some supplies. I loaded up on poster board and markers. I spent the rest of the night making my cha cha champagne, champagne stuff. So let's just hope these posters work. Monday. I brought my posters into school today, and I have to say, they came out pretty good. Do you want my polo to be your treasurer? Hey, you're dropping all our money, you fool! Remember in second grade how Marty Polo had headlines? Do you really want him touching your money? I started hanging my posters as soon as I got in, but they were only up for about three minutes until Vice Principal Roy spotted them. Mr. Roy said you weren't allowed to write fabrications about the other candidates, so I told Mr. Roy that the thing about the headlines was true. Now it practically closed down the whole school when it happened. But he took down all my posters anyway. So today, Marty Porto, Porto was going around hanging out, hanging out lollipops to buy himself votes, while my posters were sitting at the bottom of Mr. Roy's trash can. I guess this means my politi political career is officially awful. October, Monday. Well, it's officially October, and those, there are only 30 days left until Halloween. Halloween is my favorite holiday, even though mom says I'm getting too old to go trick-or-treating anymore. Halloween is dad's favorite holiday too, but for a different reason. On holiday night, while all the other parents are handing out candy, dad is hiding in the bushes with a big trash can full of water, and if any teenagers pass by our driveway, he trenches them. I'm not sure dad really understands the concept of Halloween, but I'm not gonna be the one who spoils his fun. Tonight was the opening of the Crossland High School Haunted House, and I got mom to agree to take me in rally. Riley showed up at my house wearing his Halloween costume from last year. When I called him earlier, I told him to just wear regular clothes, but of course he didn't listen. I try not to let it bother me too much, so I never been allowed to go to the Crossland Holland House before, and I wasn't going to let Riley ruin it for me. Roshrick had told me all about it, and I've been looking forward for this for about three years. 
Anyway, when we got to the entrance, I started having second thoughts about going in. There was a decapitated head going, Good evening. My mom seemed like she was in a hurry to get this over with, and she moved us along. Once we were through the gate, it was one scale after another. There were faint powers jumping out at you and people without heads and all sorts of crazy stuff. But the worst part was this area called Chainsaw Alley. There was this big guy in a hockey mask and he had a real chainsaw. Walshug told me the chainsaw had a rubber blade, but I wasn't taking any chances. Right when it, right when it looked like the chainsaw guy was going to catch us, Mom stepped in and bailed us out. That's not nice. I'm sorry, ma'am. Mom made the chainsaw guy show us where the exit was, and that was the end of our haunted house experience right there. I guess it was a little embarrassing when Mom did that, but I'm willing to let it go this one time. Saturday. The Crossland haunted house really got me thinking. Those guys were charging five bucks a pop, and the line stretched halfway around the school. I decided to make a haunted house of my own. Actually, I had to bring Rally in on the deal because Mom wouldn't let me convert our first floor into a full-out haunted mansion. I knew Rally's dad wouldn't be crazy about the idea either, so we decided to build a haunted mansion in its basement and just not mention it to his parents. Me and Rally spent most of the day coming up with an awesome plan for a haunted house. Here was our fun final plan. You enter in, and there's a hollow of screams, a lake of blood, a bottomless pit, a racked tunnel, a maze of 1,000 skulls, a knife alley, a hand hall, and then a death slide into acid lake. I don't mean to brag or anything, but what we came up with, with was way better than the Crossland High School haunted house. We realized we were going to need to roll out and that we were doing this thing. So we got some paper and made up a bunch of flyers. I'll admit, maybe we stretched the truth a little in our advertisement, but we had to make sure people actually so showed up. Haunted house with live shots! 32 Soy Street, a mission 50 cents, 3 p.m. By the time we finished putting the flowers up around the neighborhood and got back to Rally's basement, it was already 2.30, and we haven't even started putting up the actual haunted house yet, so we had to cut some corners from the original plan. When 3 o'clock rolled around, we looked outside to see if anybody had showed up, and sure enough, there were about 20 neighborhood kids waiting in line outside Rally's basement. Now I know our flyer says said the mission was 50 cents, but I could see that we had a chance to make a killing here. So I told the kids that our mission was 2 bucks, and the 50 cent thing was just a typo. The first kid to cough up his 2 bucks was Shane Sneller. He paid his money and we let him inside, and me and Rally took our positions in the hollow screens. The hollow screens was basically a bed with me and Rally on the evil side of it. I guess maybe we made the hollow screams a little too scary, because halfway through, Shane curled up in a ball underneath the bed. We tried to get him, get him to crawl out from Underdale, but he wouldn't budge. I started thinking about all the money we were losing with this kid clogging up the hollow screams, I knew we had to get him out of there quick. Eventually, Riley's dad came out uh, downstairs. At first, I was happy to see him because I thought he could help us to gra drag Shane from out from under the bed and get our haunted house cranking again. But Riley's dad was, uh, wasn't in a really helpful mood. Riley's dad wanted to know what we were doing and why Shane Sneller was curled up under the bed. We told him that the basement was a haunted house and that Shane Sneller actually paid for us to do this for, to him, but Riley's dad didn't believe us. I admit that if you looked around, it didn't really look like a haunted house. All I had to put together, time to put together was the hollow suit screams in a lake of blood, which says Riley's old baby pool with half a bottle of ketchup in it. 
I tried to show Riley's dad our original plan to prove that we really were running a legitimate operation, but he still didn't seem convinced. And to make a long story short, that was the end of our haunted house. The good news is, since Riley's dad didn't believe us, he didn't make us refund Shane's money, so at least we cleared two bucks today. Sunday Riley ended up getting grounded for that whole haunted house mess yesterday. He's not allowed to watch TV for a week, and he's not allowed to have me over at his house during that time. That last part really isn't fair because that's punishing me, and I didn't even do anything wrong. And now where am I going to play my video games? Anyway, I felt kind of bad for Rally, so tonight I tried to make it up to him. I turned on one of Rally's favorite TV shows, and I did a play-by-play -play over the phone so he could t kind of experience it that way. Wow, look at the size of that frame flow! Oh yeah, never mind. I did my best to keep up with what was going on on the screen, but to be honest with you, I'm not sure if Rally was getting the full effect. I bet this part's gonna be funny. <laughs> I was right, it was funny. Tuesday. Well, Riley, Riley's grounding is finally awful, and just in time for Halloween, too. I went up to his house to check out his costume, and I had to admit, I'm a little jealous. Riley's mom got him this night costume that's way cooler than his costume from last year. His night outfit came with a helmet and a shield and a real short sword and everything. I never had a stove thought costume before. I still have I still haven't figured out what I was, what I'm going to go as tomorrow night, so I'll probably just throw on something together at the last minute. I figure maybe I'll bring back the toilet paper mummy again. But I think it's supposed to rain tomorrow night, so that might not be the smartest idea. In the past few year, years, the growing ups in my neighborhood has been have been getting cranky about my lame costumes, and I'm starting to think it's actually having an effect on the amount of candy I'm bringing in. What are you supposed to be, a cowboy? While I wear a double baseball hat, but I don't really have time to put together a good costume because I'm in charge of planning out the best route for me and Rally to take. Uh, tomorrow night. This year, I've come up with a plan that will get us at least twice the candy we scored last year. Halloween. About an hour before we were supposed to start trick or treating, I still didn't have a costume. At that point, I was seriously thinking about going as a cowboy for the second year in a row. But then, mom knocked at my door and handed me a pilot costume with an eye patch and a hook and everything. Riley showed up around 6 30 wearing his night costume, but it didn't look anything like it looked yesterday. Riley's mom made all these safety improvements to it, and you couldn't even tell what he was supposed to be anymore. She, she cut out a big hole in the front of the helmet so he could see better, and covered him up with all this reflective tape. She made him wear his winter coat underneath everything, and he replaced his sword with a glow stick. I grabbed my pillowcase, and me and Riley started to head out, but Mom stopped us before we could get out the door. I want you to take Manny with you, and Manny was dressed as a pilot too. Man, I should have known there was a catch when Mom gave me that costume. I told Mom there was no way we were taking Manny with us, because we were going to hit 152 houses in 3 hours. And plus, we were going to be on Snake Road, which is way too dangerous for a little kid like Manny. I should never have mentioned that last part, because the next thing I knew, Mom was telling Dad he had to go along with us to make sure we didn't step foot outside our neighborhood. Dad tried to squirm him out of it, but once Mom makes up her mind, there's no way he can change it. Before we even got out of our own driveway, we ran into our neighbor Mr. Mitchell and his friend Jeremy, so and his kid Jeremy. So of course they they tagged along with us. Manny and Jeremy wouldn't trick or treat at any house with spooky decorations on them, so that ruled out pretty much every house on our block. 
Dad and Mr. Mitchell started talking about football or something, and every time one of them wanted to make a point, they would stop talking. Walking, I mean. So we were hidden only about one house every 20 minutes. After a couple of fouls, Dad and Mr. Mitchell took the little kids home. I was glad because that means me and Riley could take off. My pillowcase was almost empty, so I wanted to make up as much time as possible. A little while later, Riley told me he needed a potty break. I made him hold off for another 45 minutes, but by the time we got to my grandma, grandma's house, it was pretty cool that if I didn't let Riley use the bathroom, it was gonna get messy. So I told Riley if he wasn't back outside in one minute, I was going to start helping myself to his candy. After that, we headed back out on the road, but it was already 10.30, and I guess that's when most grown-ups decide Halloween is over. You can kinda tell because that's when they start coming to the door in their pajamas and giving you the evil eye. We decide to head home. We made up a lot of time after Dad and Manny left, so I was pretty satisfied with how much candy we took in. We don't know, when we were halfway home, this pickup truck came rolling down the street with a bunch of high school kids in it. The kid in the back was holding a fire extinguisher, and when the truck passed by us, he opened fire. I have to give Riley credit, because he blocked about 95% of the water with his shield. If we haven't done that, all of our candy would have gotten soaked. When the truck drove away, I yelled out something that I regretted about two seconds later. We'll call in the cops! The driver slammed on the brakes and he turned his truck around. Me and Riley started running, but those guys were right on our heels. The only place I could think of that was safe was Grandma's house, so we cut through a couple backyards to get there. Grandma was in bed already, but I know she keeps a key under the mat on the front porch. Once we got inside, I looked out the window to see if those guys had followed us, and sure enough, they did. I tried to trick them into leaving, but they wouldn't budge. Well, I guess that now we're safe in our own house, you can't get us. After a while, we realized the teenagers were going to raid us out, so we decided we were just going to have to spend the night with grandmas. That's when we started getting cocky, making monkey noses at the teenagers and whatnot. Well, at least I was making monkey noises. Riley was kind of making now noises, but I guess it was the same general idea. I called mom to tell her we were going to catch crash at grandma's for the night, but mom started really mad on the phone. She said it was a school night and that we had to get home right at that instant, so that meant we would have to make a run for it. I looked out the window and this time I didn't see the truck. But I knew that those guys were just hiding somewhere and just trying to draw us out. So we snuck out, out the back door, hopped over Grandma's fence, and ran all the way to Snake Road. I figured our chances were better there because there weren't any street lights. Snake Road is still scary enough on its own without having a truckload of teenagers hunting you down. Every time we saw a car moving, we dove into the bushes. It must have taken a half hour to go 100 yards. But believe it or not, we made it all the way home without getting caught. Neither of us let our guard down until we got to my driveway. But right then, there was this awful scream, and we saw a big wave of water coming towards us. Man, I forgot all about Dad, and we totally paid the price for it. When me and Riley got inside, we laid out all our candy on the kitchen table. The only things we could salvage were a couple of mints that were wrapped in cellophane and the two fusses Dr. Garrison gave us. I think next Halloween I'll just stay home and mooch off some butterfingers from the bowl Mom keeps on top of the refrigerator. November Thursday on the bus ride into school today, we passed by Grandma's house. It got rolled with toilet paper last night, which I guess was no big surprise. I do feel a little bad because it looked like it was going to take a long time to clean up. But on the bright side, Grandma is retired, so she probably didn't have anything planned for today anyway. Wednesday. 
In third period, Mr. Underwood, our first ed teacher, announced that the boys would be doing a wrestling unit for the next six, six weeks. If there was one thing most boys in my school are into, it's professional wrestling, so Mr. Underwood might as well set off a bomb. Lunch comes right after Fizz Ed, and the cafeteria was a complete madhouse. I don't know what the school is thinking having a wrestling unit, but I decided if I don't want to get twisted into a pencil for the next month and a half, I better do my homework on this wrestling business. So I rented a couple of video games to loan some moves, and you know what? After a while, I was really starting to get the hang of it. In fact, the other kids in my class have better looked out because if I keep this up, I could I could be a real threat. Then again, I better make sure I don't get too good. This name named Peter Preston Mudd got named Athlete of the Month for being the best player in the basketball unit. So they put his picture up in the hallway. P. Mudd, Athlete of the Month. It took people about five seconds to realize how P. Mud sounded when you say it out loud, and after that, it was all over for Preston. P. Mud. P. Mud. <coughs> so stay. Well, I found out today that the, the, that the kind of wrestling Mr. Underwood is teaching is completely different from the kind they do on TV. First of all, we have to wear these things called singlets, which look like those bathing suits they used to wear in the 1800s. And second of all, there are no power trifles or hitting people over the heads with chairs or anything like that. There's not even a ring with ropes around it, it's just basically a sweaty mat that sounds like that smells like it has never been washed before. Mr. Underwood started asking for volunteers so he could demonstrate some wrestling holds. But there was no way I was going to raise my hand. Me and Riley tried to hide out in the back of the gym near the coden, but that's where the girls were doing their gymnastics unit. We got out of there in a hurry, and we went back to where the rest of the guys were. Mr. Underwood singled me out, probably because I'm the lightest kid in the class. He could toss me around without straightening himself. He showed everybody how to do these things called a hat of Nelson and a fossil and a takedown and stuff like that. Uh, crap. When he was doing this one move called the Fireman's Carry, I felt a breeze down below. And I could tell my singlet was doing a good job keeping me covered up. That's when I thanked my lucky stars the girls were on the other side of the gym. Mr. Underwood divided us up into eight groups. I was pretty happy about that at first, because it meant I wasn't going to have to wrestle kids like Benny Wells, who can bench press 250 pounds. But then I found out who I did have to wrestle, and would have traded for Benny Wells in a heartbeat. Greg, you would be paired up with Fregley here. Fregley was the only kid light enough to be in my weight class, and apparently Fregley was paying attention when Mr. Underwood was giving instructions. Because he pinned me every which way you can imagine. I spent my 7th period getting way more familiar with Fugly than I ever wanted to be. Tuesday. This wrestling unit has totally turned our school upside down. Now kids are wrestling in the hallways, in the classrooms, you name it. But 15 minutes after lunch where they let us outside is the worst. You can't wa walk 5 feet without tripping over a couple of kids going at it. I just tried to keep my distance, and mark my words, one of them fools can roll right in onto the t cheese and start to cheese tuts all over again. My other problem is that I have to wrestle Fugly every single day, but this moment I realized something. If I can move out of Fugly's weight class, I won't have to wrestle him anymore. So today, I stuffed my clothes with a bunch of socks and sh shorts to get myself to the next weight class, but I was still too light to move up. I realized I was going to gain weight for real. At first, I thought I should just start loading up on junk food, but then I had a much better idea. I decided to gain my weight in muscle, not fat. I'd never been all that interested in getting in shape before. 
but this wrestling unit had, has made me rethink th think things. I figure if I bulk up now, it could actually come in handy down the road. This football unit is coming in the spring, and they split the teams up into shorts and skins, and I always get put on skins. I think they do that to make all the out of shape kids feel ashamed of themselves. If I can pack on some muscle now, it will be a whole different story, story next April. Greg carefully you want skins. Tonight after dinner, I got my mom and dad together and told them my plan. I told them I was going to need some serious exercise equipment and some weight gain powder too. I showed them some muscle magazines I got at the store so they could see how ripped I was going to be. Mom didn't really say anything at first, but Dad was pretty enthusiastic. I think he was just glad I had a chance of heart from how I used to be when I was a kid. If you walk out regularly, you can get big muscles. Muscles are gross. But Mom said if I wanted a rate set, I was going to have to prove that I could stick with an exercise regime. She, sh she said I could do that by doing sit-ups and chucking, jumping jacks for two weeks. I had to explain that the only way to get totally bulked up is to get the kind of high-tech machines they have at the gym, but Mom didn't want to hear it. Then Dad said if I wanted a bench press, then I could should keep my fingers crossed for Christmas. But Christmas is a month and a half away. If I get pinned by Fegley one more time, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. So it looks like Mom and Dad aren't going to be any help. That means I'm going to have to take matters into my own hands as usual. Saturday. I couldn't wait to start my weight training program today. Even though Mom wouldn't let me get the equipment I needed, I wasn't going to let that hold me back. So I went to the fridge and emptied out the milk and orange juice and filled the jugs with sand. Then I taped them to a broomstick and I had myself a pretty decent barbell. After that, I made a bench press out of an ironing board and some boxes. Once I had that all set, I was ready to do some serious lifting. I needed a spotting partner, so I called Rally, and when he showed up at my door wearing some ridiculous getup, I knew I made a mistake in finding him. I made Rally use the bench press first, mostly because I wanted to see if the broomstick was going to hold it up. He did about 5 reps, and he was ready to quit. But I wouldn't let him. That's what a good trainer pa training partner is for. To push you beyond your limits. 50 more, come on. I knew Rally wasn't going to be as serious about weightlifting as I was. So I decided to try an experiment to test his dedication. In the middle of Rally's set, I went and got this phony nose and mustache watch like it has in stunk junk drawer. And right when Rally had a barbell in the down position, I leaned over and looked at him. Sure enough, <laughs> sorry. Sure enough, Rally totally lost his concentration. He couldn't even get the barbell off his chest. I thought about helping him out, but then I realized that if Rally didn't get serious about working out, he was never going to get to my level. I eventually had to rescue him because he started binding the milk jug to let the sand leak out. After Riley got off the bench press, press, it was time for my set, but Riley said he didn't feel like working out anymore, he knew, and he went home. You know, I figured he'd put, pull something like that, but I guess you can't expect everyone to have the same kind of dedication as you. Wednesday Today in Geography, we had a quiz, and I have to say, I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. The quiz was on state ta capitals, and I s sit in the back of the room, right next to this giant map of the United States. All the capitals are written in b big red print, so I knew I had this one in the back. But right before the test started, Patty Phil piped up from the front of the room, Teach all, teach all. Patty told Mr. Ella that he should cover up, up the United States map before we got started. Nice catch, Patty. So thanks to Patty, I ended up flunking Chris, and I would definitely be looking for a way to pay her back for that one. 
So stay. Tonight, Mom came up to my room, and she had a fly on her hand. As soon as I saw it, I knew exactly what it was. It was an announcement that the school was having tryouts for a rental play. Man, I should have phoned that thing out when I saw it on the kitchen table. I begged her not to make me sign up. So those school plays are always musicals, and the last thing I need to have to sing a solo in front of the whole school. But all my begging seems to do, seem to do is was to make is to make mom show mo show I should do it. Mom said the only way I was going to get well rounded by was by trying different things. Dad came up in my room to see what was going on. I told Dad that Mom was making me sign up for the school play, and that if I had to start going to play pra practices, it would totally mess up my weightlifting schedule. I knew that would make Dad take my side. Dad and Mom argued for a few minutes, but Dad was no match for Mom. So that means tomorrow I ha I've got to audition for the school play. Friday. The play they're doing this year is The Wizard of Oz. A lot of kids came wearing costumes for the part they were trying out for. I never seen the movie, so for me it was like walking into a freak show. Mrs. Norton, the music director, made everyone sing, sing My Country Tis a Fee so she could hear our singing voices. I did my singing trials with a bunch of fluffer boys whose moms made them come too. I tried to sing as quietly as possible, but of course I got singled out anyway. What a lovely soprano! I have no idea what a soprano is, but from the way some of the girls were giggling, I knew it was a good thing. Trials went on forever. The grand finale came with our distance for Dorothy, who I guess is the lead character in the play, and who should try out first but Paddy Phil. I thought about trying out for the part of the rich, because I hold that in the play, the rich does all sorts of mean things to Dorothy. But then somebody co told me that there's a good rich and a bad rich, and with my luck I would end up being picked to be the good one. Monday. I was hoping Mrs. Norton would just cut me out from the play, but today she, she said that everyone who tried out is going to get a part, so lucky me. Mrs. Norton showed the Wizard of Oz movie so everybody would know the story. I, I was trying out to f I was trying to figure it out, out what part I should play, but pretty much every character has to sing or dance at one point or another. For about halfway through the movie, I figured out what part I wanted to sign up for. I'm going to sign up to be a tree because number one, they don't have to sing, and number two. They get to bean Dorothy with apples. Getting to peg Patty Phil with apples in front of a live audience would be my dream come true. I may actually have to thank mom for making me do this play once it's all over. After the movie ended, I signed up to be a tree. Unfortunately, a lot of other guys had the same idea of me, so I guess there's a lot of guys who have a bone to pick with Patty Phil. Wednesday. Well, like Mom always says, be careful for what you wish, wish for. I got pigs to be a tree, but I don't know if that's such a good thing. The tree costumes don't actually have armholes, so I guess that will saw out in the apple form. I should probably feel lucky that I got a speaking part at all. They had too many t kids trying out, and not enough roles. So he ha they had to stop making up characters. Rodri James tried out to be the Tin Man, but he got stuck with being the Shrub. Friday. Remember how I said I was lucky to get a speaking part? Well, today I found out I was I only have one line in the whole play. I say it when Dorothy picks an apple off of my branch. Ouch. That means I have to go to a two-hour practice every day just so I can say one stupid word. I'm starting to think Rodney James got a better deal as the shrub. He found a way to sneak a video game into his costume, and I'll bet that really makes the time go by. So now I'm trying to- 
So now I'm so now I'm trying to think of ways to get Mrs. Knowlton to kick me out of the play, but when you only have one role to say, it's really hard to mess up your lines. Ouch! I would say, confused. December, Thursday. The play is only a couple of days away, and I have no idea how we're going to pull this thing off. First of all, nobody has bothered to loan the lines, and that's all Mrs. Norton's fault. During rehearsal, Mrs. Norton whispers everybody's lines to them from the side of the stage. I'll get you my pretty. I'll get that you're pretty. <laughs> I wonder how it's going to go next Tuesday when Mrs. Norton is sitting at our piano 30 feet away. Another thing that's screwing everybody up is that Mrs. Norton keeps adding new scenes and new characters. Yesterday she brought in this first grader to play Dorothy's dog, Toto. But today this kid's mom came in and said she wanted her child to walk around on two legs because crawling around on all fours would be too degraded. Eng. So now we've got a dog that's going to be walking around on his hind legs for the whole show. But the worst change that is that Mrs. Norton actually wrote a song that the trees have to sing. She said everybody deserves a chance to sing in the play. So today we spent an hour learning the worst song that's ever been written. We three trees. Three trees, I mean. We three trees, I mean. Thank God Roshik won't be in the audience to see me hum humil humiliate myself. Elf. Mrs. Norton said the play is going to be a semi-formal occasion, and I know there's no way Roshik is going to wear a tie for a middle school play. But today wasn't all bad. Towards the end of the fact is, Archie Kelly tripped over Rodney James and chipped his tooth because he couldn't stick his arms out or out to break his fall. So the good news is, the letting us trees cough out armholes for the performance. Tuesday. Tonight was the big school production of The Wizard of Oz. The first sign that things were not going to go well happened before the play even started. I was peeking through the curtain to check out how many people showed up to see the play, and guess who was standing right up front? My brother Roderick wearing a clip on tie. He must have found out I was singing, and he couldn't resist the chance to see me embarrass, embarrass myself. The play was supposed to start at 8, but it got delayed because Rodney James had stage fright. You would figure that someone whose job it is to, to sit on the stage and do nothing could just suck it up for one performance, but Rodney wouldn't budge, and eventually his mom had to carry him off. The play finally got started around 8.30. Nobody could remember the lines, just like I predicted, but Mrs. Norton kept things moving along with old piano. The kid, tid, kid, the kid who played Toto brought a stool and a pile of comic books onto the stage, and that totally ruined the whole dog effect. When it was time for the first scene, me and the other cheeks hopped on to, into our positions. The curtains rose, and when they did, I heard Manny's voice. Bobby! <sighs> Great. I've been able to keep that nickname quiet for five years, and now all of a sudden the whole town knew it. I could feel about 300 pairs of eyeballs pouring my way. So I did, did some crit at a blibbing, and I was able to deflect the embarrassment over to Archie Kelly. I think he got the apple, Bobby. But the major, <coughs> but the major embarrassment was still on the way. When I heard Mrs. Norton playing the first few bars of Reef Three Trees, I felt my stomach jump. I looked out at the audience and I noticed Roderick was holding a video camera. I knew that if I sang the song and Roderick recorded it, he would keep the tape forever and use it to hum humiliate me for the rest of my life. I didn't know what to do, so when the time came to singing, I just kept my mouth shut. We free trees from yon oak glen. For a few seconds though, things went okay. I feel that if I didn't technically sing the song, then Roderick wouldn't have anything to hold over my head. But after a few seconds, the other trees noticed I wasn't singing. 
I guess they mu might have must have thought I knew something that they didn't, so they stopped singing too. To spy a mirror from in sweet. Not the three of us were just standing there, not saying a word. Mrs. Nolan must have had thought we'd forgotten the words to the song, because she came over to the side of the stage and whispered the rest of the lyrics to us. But as we are suited to our spots, she doves move on lighter feet. The song is only about three minutes long, but to me it felt like an hour and a half. I was just praying the curtains would go down so we could hop off the stage. That's when I noticed Pat Patty Phil standing in the rings, and if looks could kill, us trees would be dead. She probably thought we were ruining her chances of making it to Broadway or something. Seeing Patty standing there reminded me why I signed up to a tree in the first place. I threw an apple at her. Pretty soon, the rest of the tree started throwing apples too. I think Toto even got in on the act. Somebody knocked the glasses off of Patty's head, and one of the lynches broke. Mrs. Nolan had to shut down the play after that, because Patty can't see two feet in front of her without her glasses. After the play was awful, my family went home together. Mom has bought a b had bought a bouquet of flowers, and I guess they were supposed to be for me, but she ended up tossing them in the trash can on the way out the door. I just hope that everybody who came to see the play was as entertained as I was. Wednesday Well, if one good thing came out of the play, it's that I don't have to worry about the Bubby nickname anymore. I saw Archie Kelly getting hassled in the hallway after 5th period today, so it looks like I can finally start to breathe a little easier. Sunday With all the stuff going on at school, I haven't even had time to think about Christmas, and just less than 10 days away. In fact, the only thing that tipped me off that Christmas was coming was when Roderick put his wish list up on the refrigerator. Roderick's wish list Number one, new drums. Number two, new fan. Number three, struck, struck in head. I usually make a big wish list every year, but this Christmas, all I really want is this video game called Twisted Wizard. Tonight, Manny was going through the Christmas catalog, picking out all the stuff he wants with a big red marker. Manny was circling every single toy in the catalog. He was even circling really expensive things like a giant motorized car and stuff like that. So I decided to step in and give him some good big brotherly advice. I told him that if he circled stuff that was too expensive, he was going to end up with a bunch of clothes for Christmas. I said he should just pick three or four medium sized gifts so he would end up with a couple of things he actually wanted. But of course, Manny just went back to circling everything again, so I guess he'll just have to learn the hard way. When I was seven, the only thing I really wanted for Christmas was a Bobby Dream House, and not because I like girls' toys, like Roderick said. I just thought it would be a really awesome fault for my toy soldiers. When Mom and Dad saw my wish list that year, they got in a big fight over it. Dad said that there was no way he was getting me a dollhouse, but Mom said it was healthy for me to experiment with other toys I wanted to play with. Believe it or not, Dad actually won that argument. Dad told me to start my wish list over and pick some toys that were more appropriate for boys. But I have a secret weapon when it comes to Christmas. My Uncle Charlie always gets me whatever I want. I told him I wanted the Bobby Dream House, and he said he would hook me up. On Christmas, when Uncle Charlie gave me my gift, it was not what I asked for. He must have walked into the toy store and picked up the first thing he saw that had the word Bobby on it. So if you ever see a picture of me where I'm holding a beach fun Bobby, now at least you know the whole story. Dad wasn't real happy when he saw that what Uncle Charlie got me. He told me to either throw it out or give it to charity. But I kept it anyway. And okay, I admit, maybe I took it out and played with it once or twice. 
That's how I ended up in a emergency room with, two weeks later with a pink bobby shoe stuck up my nose. And believe me, Roger has never let me hear dinner of that. Thursday. Tonight me and mom went out to get a gift for the Giffen tree at church. The Giffen tree is basically a secret Santa kind of thing, where you get a gift for someone who is needy. Mom picked up picked out a red wool sweater for our Giffen tree guy. I tried to talk mom to get us something a lot cooler, like a TV or a slushy machine or something like that. Just imagine if all I got on Christmas was a wool sweater. I'm sure a Giffen tree guy will throw his sweater out in the trash, along with the tin canes and yams we sent us away during the Thanksgiving food drive. Christmas when I woke up this morning and went downstairs, there were about a million gifts under the Christmas tree, but when I started digging around, there were hardly getting any gifts with my name on them. But Manny made it out like a bandit. He got every single thing he soaked out in the catalog, no lie. So I bet, so I bet he's glad he didn't listen to me. I did find a couple of things with my name on them, but they were mostly books and socks and stuff like that. I open my gifts in front in the corner behind the couch because I don't like opening gifts near dad. Whenever somebody opens a gift, dad swoops right in and cleans, cleans up after him. Them. I gave Mandy a toy helicopter and I gave Roderick a book about rock bands. Roderick gave me a book too, but of course he didn't wrap it. The book he got me was Best of Little Cu Cutie. Little Cutie is the worst comment in the newspaper, and Roderick knows how much I hate it. I think it's the fourth year in a row I got in a Little Cutie book from him. I gave Mom and Dad their gifts. I get them the same kind of stuff every year, but parents eat that stuff up. Stuff that says, number one dad, number one mom, number one whatever on it. The rest of the relatives started showing up around 11 o'clock. And Uncle Charlie came at noon. Uncle Charlie brought a big trash bag full of gifts, and he pulled my present out of the top of the bag. The package was the exact size, right, the exact right size and shape to be a twisted wizard game. So I knew Uncle Charlie came through to me, for me. Mom got the camera ready, and I tore open my gift. But it was just an eight by ten photo of Uncle Uncle Charlie. I guess I didn't do a good job at hiding my disappointment, and mom got mad. All I can say is, I'm glad I'm still a kid, because if I had to act happy about the Kaiser Gifts grown up skit, I don't think I could pull it off. Bless this house. I know the perfect place for this. I just knew you'd love it. I went up to my room to take a break for a while. A couple minutes later, Dan knocked on my door. He told me he had my gift for me out in the garage, and the reason it was out there was because it was too big to wrap. And when I walked down to the garage, there was a brand new rate set. That thing must have cost a fortune. I did have to hop to tell Dad that I kind of lost interest in the whole rate lifting thing where the rest of the unit ended last week, so I just said thanks instead. I think Dad was expecting me to drop down and start doing some reps or something, but I just excused myself and went back out inside. At about 6, all the relatives cleared out. I was sitting on the couch watching Manny play with his toys, feeling pretty sorry for myself. Then Mom came up to me and said that she found a gift behind the piano with my name on it, and it said, From Santa. The box was way too big for Twisted Whistled, but Mom pulled the same big box trick on me last year when she got me a memory card for my video game system. So I ripped open the package and pulled out my presents, only this wasn't Twisted Whistled either. It was a giant red wool sweater. At first I thought Mom was playing some kind of practical joke on me, because this sweater was the same kind we bought for my Giffen uh, tree guy, but mom seemed pretty confused too. She said she did buy me a video game and that she had no idea what the sweater was doing in my box. And then I figured it out. 
I told mom there must have been some kind of mix up and I got the Giffen Tries Giffen Tree guy's gift and he got mine. Mom said she used the same kind of wrapping paper for both of our gifts, so she must have written the wrong names on the cat tags. But then Mom said that this was really a good thing, because the Giffen Tree guy was probably really happy he got such a great gift. It's a Christmas miracle! I had to explain that you need a video game system and a TV to play Twisted Wizard, so the game was totally useless to him. Even though my Christmas was not going that great, I'm sure it's going a lot, a whole lot worse for the Giffen Tree guy. Jokes. I kind of decided to throw in the towel for this Christmas, and I headed up to Riley's house. I forgot to get a gift for Riley, so I just slapped a ball on the little cutie book Rasha gave me, and that seemed to do the trick. Riley's parents have a lot of money, so I can always count on them for a good gift. But Riley said that this year he picked out my gift himself. Then he brought me outside to show me what it is. From the way Riley was hyping up his presents, I thought he might must have gotten me a big screen TV or a motorcycle or something. But once again, I let my hopes get too high. Riley got me a big reel. I guess I would have thought this was a cool gift when I was in the third grade. But I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with one now. Riley was so enthusiastic about it that I tried my best to act like I was happy anyway. Gee, thanks. We went back inside and Riley showed me his Christmas loot. He, sh he sure got a lot more stuff than I did. He even got Twisted Wizard, so at least I can play it when I get come up to his house. That is, until Riley's dad finds out how violent it is. And boy, you've never seen someone as happy as Riley with his little cutie book. His mom said it was the only thing on his list that he didn't get. Well, I'm glad someone got what they wanted today. New Year's Eve In case you're wondering what I'm doing in my room at 9 o'clock on New Year's Eve, let me fill you in. Earlier today, me and Manny were hosting around in the basement. I found a tiny black ball of thread in, on the carpet, and I told many of us a spider. Then I hold it over and pretended like I was going to make him eat it. Yeah! <laughs> right when I was about to let Manny go, he slapped my hand and made me drop the thread. And guess what? That fool swallowed it. Well, Manny completely lost his mind. He ran upstairs to where mom was. And I knew I was in big trouble. Manny told mom I made him eat a spider. I told her there was no spider and that was just a tiny ball of thread. Mom brought Manny over to the kitchen table. Then she put a seed, a raisin, and a grape on a plate and told Manny to point at the thing that was the closest in size to the piece of thread he swallowed. Manny took a vow to look over the things on the plate. Then he walked over to the refrigerator and pulled out, <laughs> and pulled out an orange. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. So that's why I got sent to bed at 7 o'clock and I'm not downstairs watching the New Year's Eve special on TV. And that's also why my only New Year's resolution is to never play with Romani again. January. Wednesday. I found a way to have some fun with the big wheel Rally got me for Christmas. I came up with this game where one guy ri rides down the hill and the other di guy tries to knock him off with a football. Rally was the first one run down the hill and I was the foal. It is a lot harder to hit a moving target than I thought. Plus I didn't even get a lot of practice. It took Riley like 10 minutes to walk the big wheel back up the hill after each every trip down. Riley kept a asking to switch places and have me be the one who rides the big wheel, but I'm no fool. That thing was hitting 35 miles per hour and it didn't have any brakes. Do you want to have a tone now? <sighs> no thanks, I'm not as good as you. Anyways, I never did knock Riley off the big wheel today. But I guess I have something to work at all for the rest of Christmas vacation. Thursday. 
I was heading up to rallies today to play our big wheel game again, but mom said I had to finish my Christmas thank yous before I went out anywhere. I thought I could just crank out my thank you cards in a half hour, but when it came to actually writing them, my mind went blank. Let me tell you, it's not easy writing thank you notes for stuff you didn't want in the first place. I started with the non-closed items because I thought they would be easiest, but after two or three cards, I realized that I was practically writing the same thing every time. So I wrote up a general form on the computer with blanks for the things I needed to change. Writing the cards from there was a breeze. Dear Aunt Lydia, Thank you so much for the awesome encyclopedia. How do you know I wanted that for Christmas? I love to read the encyclopedia looks on my shelf. All my friends will be so jealous that I have my very own encyclopedia. Thank you for making this the best Christmas ever. Cecily Gregg. My system worked out pretty well for the first couple of gifts, but after that, not so much. Dear Aunt Lydia, thank you so much for the awesome pens. How do you know I wanted that for Christmas? I love the way the pants look on my legs. <laughs> All my friends would be so jealous that I have my very own pants. Thank you for making this the best Christmas ever. <laughs> I get cold in it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sincerely, Greg. Friday. I finally knocked Rally off the big wheel today, but it didn't happen the way I expected. I was trying to hit them, him in the shoulder, but I missed, and the football went under the front tile. Ra Rally tried to break his fall by sticking out his arms, but he landed pretty hard on his left hand. I figured he would just shake it off and get right back on the back, but he didn't. I usually I tried to cheer him up, but all the jokes that usually crack, crack him up won't work again. So I knew he must be hurt really bad. Hey, look at me, I'm your dad, na na na. <laughs> Monday. Christmas vacation is awful, and now we're back at school. And you remember Rally's big wheel accident? Well, he broke his hand, and now he has to wear a cast. And, every, and today, everyone was crowding around him like he was a hero or something. Does it still hurt? A little, I guess. You poor thing. I tried to cash in on some of Rally's new popularity, but it totally backfired. I'm the one who broke this hand. You meanie. I lunched a bunch of girls and invited Rally over to the table so they could feed him. What really ticks me off about that is that Rally is right-handed and it's his left hand that's broken, so he can feed himself this fine. Here comes the airplane! Yum yum! Tuesday. I realized Rally's entry thing is a pretty good racket, so I decided it was time for me to have an entry of my own. I took some gauze from home and I wrapped it up my hand to make it look like it was hurt. It's a rash infection caused by a splinter that was left untreated. I couldn't figure out why the girls weren't swarming me like they swarmed Rally, but then I realized what the problem was. See, the cast is a great gimmick, because everybody wants to sign their name on it, but it's not exactly easy to sign gauze with a pen. So I came up with a solution that I thought was just as good. Would you be the first to sign my sympathy sheet? That idea was a total bust too. My mates did end up attracting attention from a couple of people, but believe me, they were not the type of people I was looking, going for. Can I pick at your affection? Fregley said at me. Go away. Monday. Last week, we started the third quarter at school, so now I have a whole bunch of new classes. One of the classes that I sign up for is something called independent study. I wanted to sign up for home economics too, because I was pretty good at home at one. But pretty but getting but being good at sewing does not exactly buy you popularity points at school. Hey look, Greg has the post. Actually it's an embroidered book bag. Okay, posy. 
Anyways, this independent study thing is an experiment they will shine out at our school for the first time. The idea is that cl the class gets assigned a project and then you have to work on it together with no teacher in the room for the whole quarter. Bad idea if you ask me. It's, it's the same. It's outside the book. The catch is that when you're done, everybody in your group gets the same grade. I found out that Ricky Fisher is in my class, which could be a big problem. Ricky's big claim to fame is that he'll pick he'll pick the gum off the bottom of a desk and chew it if you pay him fifty cents. So I don't really have high hopes for our final grade. Tuesday. Today we got our independent study assignment, and guess what it is? We have to build a robot. I thought everybody was kind of freaked out because we thought we were going to have to build a robot from scratch. But Mr. Darnell told us that we didn't have to build an actual robot. We just need to come up with ideas for what our robot might look like and what kind of things it would be able to do. So then he left the room and we were on our own. He started brainstorming right away. I wrote down a bunch of ideas on the blackboard. The robot would do my homework, do the dishes, make my breakfast, brush my teeth. Everybody was pretty impressed with my ideas, but it was easy to come up with them. All I did was write down all the things I hate doing myself. But a couple of the girls got up to the front of the room and they had some ideas of their own. They erased my list and drew up their own plan. They wanted to invent a robot that would give you dating advice and have 10 types of lip gloss on its fingertips. All these guys thought this was the stupidest idea we have ever heard. So we ended up splitting into two groups, girls and boys. The boys went to the other side of the room while the girls stood around talking. Now, now that we had all the serious photos in one place, we got to work. That's, that's really sexist. Someone had the idea that you can. Someone had the idea that you can say your name to the robot and it can say it back to you. Hi, Bob. It is very nice to meet you, Bob. That's very easy to code. But since someone else pointed out that you shouldn't be able to use bad words for your name because the robot shouldn't be able to code, so we decided we should come up with a list of all the bad words the robot should it be able to say. We came up with all the regular bad words, but then Ricky Fisher came up with 20 more the rest of us has never even heard before. So Ricky ended up being one of the most valuable contributors on this project. Right before the bell rang, Miss O'Donnell came back in the room to check on our progress. He packed up the piece of paper he picked up the piece of paper we were writing on and read it over. To make a long story sh short, independent studies cancelled for the rest of the year. Well, at least it is for us boys. So if the robots in the future are going around with cherry lip, lip gloss for fingers, at least now you know how it all got started. Thursday. In school today, they had a general assembly and they showed the movie It's Great To Be Me, which they show us every year. The movie is all about how you should be happy with who you are and not change anything about yourself. To be honest with you, I think that's a really dumb message to be telling kids, especially the ones at my school. It's great to be me! <laughs> While shoving a kid down. Later on, they made an announcement that there were some openings on the safety patrols and that got me thinking. If someone picks on a safety patrol, I can get them suspended. The way I figure it, I can use any extra protection I can get. Plus, I realized that maybe being in a position of authority could be good for me. Can we please cross the street now? Nope. But we've been standing here for an hour. I went down to Mr. Winsky's house and signed myself up. And I got Alex to sign up too. I thought Mr. Risky would make us do a bunch of chin-ups or jumping jacks or something to prove you're up for the job, but he just handed us our belts and badges on the spot. Mr. Rinsky said to open his role for special assignments. Our school is right next to the elementary school, 
and they have a half day kindergarten there. He wants us to walk the morning session kids home in the middle of the day. I, I realized that meant we would miss 20 minutes of free algebra. Rowling must have figured that out too because he started to speak up, but I gave him a wicked pinch underneath the desk before he could finish his sentence. But we would miss the yeah, hurry! I couldn't believe my luck. I was getting instant bully protection and a free pass from half a free algebra, and I didn't even have to lift a finger. Tuesday. Today was our first day as safety patrols. Me and Valley didn't technically have stations like all the other patrols, so that means we don't have to stand around out in the freezing cold for an hour before school. But that didn't stop us from coming to the cafeteria for the free hot chocolate they hand out to the other patrols before homeroom. Another great perk is that you can get to show up 10 minutes late for first period. Hello. I walk in with my hot chocolate. I'm telling you, I got it made with this safety patrol thing. At 12.15, me and Rally left school and walked to kindergarten or so home. The whole trip ate up 45 minutes and there were only 20 minutes of pre algebra left when we got back. Walking the kids home was no sweat, but one of the kindergartners started to smell a little funny and I think maybe he had an accident in his pants. He tried to let me know about it, but I just kept, but I just stared straight ahead and kept walking. I'll take these kids home, but believe me, I didn't sign up for any diaper duty. February, Wednesday. Today it snowed for the first time this winter, and school was cancelled. We were supposed to have a test in pre-algebra, and I kind of slacked off ever since I became a safety patrol, so I was psyched. I called Valley and told him to come over. Me and him have been talking about building the world's biggest snowman for the last couple of years now. And when I'm saying the world's biggest snowman, I'm not kidding. Our goal is to get into the Guinness Book of World Records. But every time we've gotten serious about going for the record, all the snow has melted, and we've missed our window of opportunity, so this year, I want to get started right away. When Rally came over, we started rolling the first snowball, snowball to make the base. I figured the base was going to have to be at least 8 feet tall on its own if we wanted to have a shot at the breaking the record. But the snowball got real heavy, and we had to take a bunch of breaks in between rolls so we can catch our breath. During one of our breaks, Mom came outside to go to the grocery store, but our snowball was blocking the car in, so we got a little free label out of her. After our break, me and Rally pushed that snowball until we couldn't push it any further. But when we looked behind us, we saw the mess we have made. The, snowma the snowball has gotten so heavy that it tore up all the sod that has just laid out its fall. I was hoping it would snow a few more inches and cover up our tracks, but just like that, it stopped snowing. Our plan, was, our plan to build the world's biggest snowman was starting to fall apart, so I came up with a better idea for our snowball. Every time it snows, the kids from Wally Street use our hill for sledding, even though this isn't their neighborhood. So tomorrow morning, when the Wally Street kids come marching up our hill, me and Rally are going to teach those guys a lesson. Um, we're going to throw the snowball down at those punks. Thursday. When I woke up this morning, the snow was already starting to melt. So I told Ra Rally to hurry up and get down to my house. While I was waiting to for Rally to show up, I watched Manny trying to build a snowman out of the critically crumbs of, of snow that was that were left over from our snowball. It was actually kind of pathetic. I, I really couldn't help doing what I did next. Unfortunately for me, right at that moment, Dad was at the front window. Dad was already mad at me for tearing up the sod, so I knew I was sinful. for it. I heard the garage door open and I saw Dad coming outside. He marched right out carrying a snow shovel and I thought I was going to have to make a run for it. 
but Dad was headed for my snowball, not me, and in less than a minute he reduced all of our hard work to nothing. Riley came by a few minutes later, I thought he might actually get a kick out of what happened. But I guess he had his heart set on rolling that snowball down the hill. He was really mad. But get this, Riley was mad at me for what Dad did. I told Riley he was being a big baby, and we got in a shoving match. Right when it looked like we were going to get in an all-out fight, we got ambushed by the street. It was a hit and run by the Wally Street kids. If Mrs. Levine, my English teacher, was there, I'm sure she, she would have said the whole situation was ironic. Wednesday Today at school, they announced there was an opening for the cartoonist job in the school paper. So there's only one comic slot, and up until now, this kid named Vine Little has been hogging it all to himself. Vine has this comic called Wacky Dog, and when he, he, it started off, it was actually pretty funny. But lately, Vine's been using the strip to handle his personal pin business. I guess that's why they gave him the axe. Hey, Wacky Dog, say something funny! Actually, I have something serious in my mind today. Susan Lim, if you are reading this, Vine is very sorry you kissed your best friend Rachel behind the lockers. He hopes you can find it in your heart to forgive him. P.S. Billy Bomber, you still own Vine. Five dollars, you bum. As soon as I heard the news, I knew I had to try out. Wacky Dog made Vine Little a celebrity out of school, and I even wanted a in to get in on some of that kind of fame. I had a taste of what it's like to get, get be famous at my school when I won honorable mention in this anti-smoking contest they had. All I did was trace a picture from one of Roderick's heavy metal, metal magazines, but luckily nobody ever fell in that fine out. Don't smoke or you'll look like me. The kid who won first place is named Chris Harney. And what kind of ticks me off is that Chris smokes at least a pack of cigarettes a day. Don't smoke is a joke. First place. Thursday. Me and Riley decided to team up and do a cartoon together. So after school today, he came over to my house and we got to work. We banged out a bunch of characters real quick. But that turned out to be the easy part. When we tried to think up some jokes, we kind of hit a wall. I finally came up with a good solution. I made up a cartoon where the punchline of Feffy Strip is Zooey Mama. That way we wouldn't get bogged down to having to write actual jokes and we could concentrate on, concentrate on the pictures. For the first couple of strips, I did the writing and drew the characters and Riley drew the boxes around the pictures. Step on a crack, break your mama's back. Yeah, right. Hey, Timmy, your mother slipped on a banana peel, and P.S. she is dead. Zooey, mama! <laughs> Riley just started complaining that he didn't have enough to do, so I let him write a couple of the strips. But to be honest with you, there, were a pretty there was a pretty obvious drop in quality once Riley started doing the writing. I've been waiting three hours to get a hamburger. Finally, one hamburger, please. I'm sorry, so we are all sold out. Zooey Mama. Eventually, I got kind of sick of the Zooey Mama idea, and I pretty much let Rally take over the whole operation. And believe it or not, Rally's drawing skill still skills are worse than his writing skills. Oops, I stepped in a puddle. At least it's not an acid puddle. Ay ay ay, it is an acid puddle. Zee mama. I told Riley maybe we should come up with some new ideas, but he just wanted to keep writing Zee mamas. He then packed up his comments, comics and went home, which was fine by me. I don't really want to be partnered up with a kid who doesn't draw noses anyway. Friday. After Rally left yesterday, I really got to work on some comics. I came up with this character called Creighton the Cretan, and I got on a roll. Hi, my name is Creighton. No, it isn't. Your name is Stuart Pid. Oops, hi, I'm Stuart Pid. 
<laughs> I must have banged out 20 strips, and I didn't even break a strip. I wonder what's in this cute little box. That's not a box, it's a brick, you dumb moron. Oops, I've been trying to open it all day. Doctor, can I have a new butt? My old one has a crack in it. Creighton, I told you a million times, everybody's butt has a crack in it. Oh yeah, I forgot. The great thing about these Creighton the Creighton comics is that with all the idiots running around my school, I will never run out of new material. When I got to school today, I took my comics to Mr. Aria's office. He's the teacher who runs the school newspaper. But when I went to turn my strips in, I saw there were a pile of comics from other kids who were trying out for the job. Most of them were pretty bad, so I wasn't too worried about the competition. Girls Rule by Tarasil Cuddle and Lisa Russell Don't walk near our lunch table, Tile Green. Yeah, you're not even cute. He falls. Ha 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 Girls Rule. Extremes, Skaters. I'm gonna do this rad jump. Uh, yo, dude, what's out for that telephone wire? Whatever. Here I go. And then he cuts his head on the telephone wire. Ouch. I'm sure, I'm sure I'm glad I wore my helmet. One of the comics was called Dumb Teachers, and it was written by this kid named Bill Tritt. Bill is always in attention, so I guess he has a bone to pick with just about every teacher in school, including Miss Aurea. So I'm not too worried about the chances of Bill's comet getting an ethel. Hey, Miss O'Rea, you pooped your pants again. Nah, uh yeah. There were actually one or two decent comics in the bin, but I slipped on uh, slipped them under a pile of paperwork on Miss O'Rea's desk. Hopefully, those ones won't turn up until I'm in high school. Thursday. Today. During morning announcements, I got the news I was hoping for, and the new cartoonist for the school paper is Greg Heffley. I know I didn't summon us. The paper came out today at lunchtime, and everybody was reading it. I really wanted to pick up a copy to see my name and friends, but I decided to just play it cool for a while instead. I sat at the end of the lunch table so there would be plenty of room for me to start signing autographs for my new fans. But nobody was coming over to tell me how great my comic was, and I started to get a feeling something was wrong. I grabbed a paper and ran into the bathroom to check it out, and when I saw my comic, I practically had a heart attack. Miss Aria told me he had made some minor edits to my comic. I thought he just meant he fixed spelling mistakes and stuff like that, but he totally bushered it. The comic he ruined was one of my favorite ones, too. In the original, Creighton Creighton is taking a math is, uh, is taking a math test, and he accidentally eats it. And then the teacher yells at him for being such a moron. By the way, Miss Aria was done with it. By the time Miss Aria was done with it, you probably couldn't recognize it as the same strip. Teacher, if x plus forty three equals eighty nine, then what would x be? Creighton, x would be forty six. Thanks. Kids, if you want to learn more about math, make sure to visit Mr. Humphreys during his office hours, or visit the library and check out the newly expanded math and science section. So I'm pretty sure I won't be signing autographs anytime soon. Soon. Jesus pets. Shove. March. Wednesday. Me and Rally were enjoying our hot chocolate in the cafeteria with the rest of the patrols today. And there was an announcement on the loudspeaker. Riley Jefferson will port to Mr. Whiskey's office immediately. Riley went down to Mr. Whiskey's office, and when Riley came back 15 minutes later, he looked pretty shaken up. Apparently, Mr. Whiskey got a call from a parent who said they witnessed Riley terrorizing the kindergartners when he was supposed to be walking them home from school, and Mr. Whiskey was really mad about it. Riley said Mr. Whiskey yelled at him for about 10 minutes and said that his accents disrespected the badge. You know, I think I might just know what this is all about. Last week, Riley had to take a quiz during the fourth period, so I walked to the kindergarten home on my own. 
It has rained that morning, and there were a lot of worms on the sidewalk, so I decided to have some fun with the kids. I chased them with one of the worms. But some neighborhood lady saw what I was doing, and she yelled at me from the front porch. It was Mrs. Olfine, who is friends with Riley's mom. She must have, she must have thought I was Riley, because I was following his coat, and I wasn't about to correct her evil. Riley Jefferson, the principal, is going to hear about this! Yes, ma'am. I forgot about the whole incident until today. And in the, anyways, Mr. Winsky told Riley he's going to have to apologize to the kindergarten little tomorrow morning, and now he's suspended from patrols for a week. I knew I should probably just tell Mr. Whiskey it was me who chased the kids for the worms, but I wasn't ready to set the record straight just yet. I knew if I confessed, I would lose my hot chocolate privileges, and that right there was enough to keep me, to make me keep quiet for the whole time being. At dinner tonight, Mom could tell if something was bothering me, so she came up to my room afterward to talk. I told her I was in a tough situation and I didn't know what to do. I got to give mom credit for how she handled it. She didn't try to pry and get all the details. All she said is that I should try and do the right thing because it's our choices that make us who we are. I figured that's pretty decent advice, but I'm still not 100% sure what I'm going to do tomorrow. Thursday. Well, I was up all night tossing and toning over this rally situation. But I finally made up my mind. I decided the right thing to do was to just let Rally take one for the team this time around. I so I'm sorry I terrorized you children. And all the children were confused. On the way home from school, I came clean with Rally and told him the whole truth about what happened and how it was me who chased, chased the kids with the worms. Then I told him that there were lessons we can both learn from this. I told him I learned... I'd, I learned to be more careful about what I do in front of Mrs. Olfine's house, and that, that he learned a valuable lesson too, which is this. Be careful about who you lend your coat to. I just, this has been a learning experience, experience for both of us. To be honest with you, my methods didn't really seem to be getting through to rally. We were supposed to hang out after school today, but he said he was just going to go home and take a nap. I couldn't really blame him, because if I didn't have my hot chocolate this morning, I wouldn't have had much energy evil. When I got home, Mom was waiting for me at the front door. Did he do the right thing? Yeah. Mom took me out to get some ice cream as a special treat. And what, and what this whole episode has taught me is that every once in a while, it's not such a bad idea to listen to your mother. Tuesday there was enough for announcement on the loudspeaker today, and to be honest with you, I kind of figured this one was coming. Greg Hefley, please report to Mr. Rinsky's office. I knew it was just a matter of time before I got busted for what happened last week. When I got to Mr. Rinsky's office, he was really mad. Mr. Rinsky told me that an anonymous source had informed him that I was the real culprit in the warm chasing incident. incident. Then he told me that I was relieved of my safety patrol duties effective immediately. Well, it does take a detective to figure out that the anonymous source was Rally. I can't believe Rally went and backstabbed me like that. While I was sitting there getting chewed out by Mr. Whiskey, I was thinking, I need to remember to give my friend a lecture about loyalty. Later on today, Rally got reinstated as a patrol, and get this, he actually got a promotion. Mr. Whiskey said Rally had exhibited dignity under false suspicion. I thought about really letting Rally have it for ratting me out like that, but then I realized something. In June, all the officers in the safety patrols go on a trip to Six Flags, and they get to take along one friend. I need to make sure Rally knows I'm his guy. I'll pick up Rally's backpack saying, let me get this for you, Captain. Tuesday. Like I said before, the worst part of getting kicked off safety patrols is losing your hot chocolate privileges. Every morning, I go to the back door of the cafeteria so Rally can hook me up. 
But either my friend has gone deaf, or he's too busy kissing the other officer's butts to notice me at the window. In fact, now that I think of it, Riley's been totally giving me the cold shoulder lately, and that's totally lame, because if I recall correctly, he's the one that sold me out. Even though Riley's been a total joke lately, I tried to break the ice with him today anyway, but even that didn't seem to work. I tried to throw a snowball at him, saying, Hi, pal, but he ignored me. April, Friday. Ever since the Rome incident, Riley has been hanging out with Colin Lee every day after school. What really stinks is that Colin was, is supposed to be my backup friend. Th those guys are to acting totally ridiculous. Today, Riley and Colin were wearing these matching t-shirts and made me just about want to vomit. It said best friends on it and had a picture of them. After dinner tonight, I saw Riley and Colin walking up the hill together, chumming it up. Colin had his overnight bag, so I knew they were going to do a sleepover at Riley's, and I thought, well, two can play at that game. The best way to get back at Riley was to, to get a, was to get a new best friend of my own, but unfortunately, the only person who came to mind right at that moment was Fregley. I went up to Fregley's with my overnight bag so Riley can see that I had other friend options too. When I got there, Fregley was in his front yard stabbing a kite with his skit with a skit stick. That's when I started to th think maybe this wasn't the best idea after all. But Riley was in his front yard, and he was watching me, so I knew there was no turning back. I invited myself into Fregley's house. His mom said she was excited to see Fregley with a playmate, which was a tome I was not too enthusiastic about. Me and Fregley went upstairs to his room. Fregley tried to get me to play Twister with him, so I made sure I stayed ten feet away from him at all times. I decided that I should just pull the plug on this stupid idea and go, go home, but every time I looked out the window, Riley and Colin were still in Riley's front yard. I didn't want to leave until those I didn't want to leave until those guys went back inside, but things started to get out of hand with Fregley pretty quickly. When I was looking out the window, Fregley broke into my backpack and ate the whole bag of jelly beans I had in there. Fregley's one of those kids who's not supposed to eat any sugar, so two minutes later, he was bouncing off the walls. Fregley started act acting like a total maniac, and he chased me all around his upstairs. I keep thinking he was going to come down off his sugar high, but he didn't. Eventually, I locked myself in his bathroom to rain him out. Around 11.30, it got quiet out in the hallway. That's when Fregley slipped a piece of paper under the door. I picked it up and read it. Dear old Gregory, I'm very sorry I chased you with a booger on my finger. Here, I put it on this finger so you can get me back. And my finger was on the booger. That's the last thing I remember before I blacked out. I came to my senses a few hours later. After I woke up, I cracked the door open, and I heard snowing coming from Fregley's room, so I decided to make a run for it. Mom and Dad were not happy with me for getting them out of bed at 2 in the morning, but at that point, I could really care less. Monday Well, me and Riley have officially been ex-friends for about a month now, and to be honest with you, I'm better off without him. I'm glad I can just do whatever I want without having to worry about carrying all that dead weight around. Lately, I've been hanging out in Roderick's room after school and going through his stuff. The other day, I found one of his middle school yearbooks. Roderick wrote on everybody's picture in his yearbook so it can tell how he felt about all the kids in his grade. Joke, joke, cool. Every once in a while, I see Roderick's old classmates around town, and I have to remember to thank Roderick for making church a lot more interesting. I see somebody at the church, and, it, and Roderick labeled him joke. 
Flip the page in Roderick's yearbook that's really interested in is the class favorites page. That's where they put pictures of the kids who got voted most popular and most talented and all that. Roderick wrote on his class favorites page too. On the most likely to succeed page, there were two people, Bill Watton and Kathy Wren, and he labeled Bill Watton a node. You know, this class favorites thing has really got my gears toning. If you can get yourself folded onto the class favorites page, you're, fact you're practically immortal. Even if you don't live up to what you got picked for, it doesn't really matter because it's on permanent record. People still treat Bill Watson like he's something special, even though he ended up dropping out of high school. We still run into him at the food barn every once in a while. Will that be paper or plastic, man? So here's what I'm thinking. This school year has been kind of a bust, but I can but if I can get folded as a class favorite, I'll go out on a high note. I've been trying to think of a category I've a shot at. Most popular and most athletic are definitely out, so I'm going to have to find something that's a little bit more in reach. At first I thought maybe I should wear really nice clothes for the rest of the year so I can get best dressed. But that would mean I would have to get my picture taken with Jenna Stewart and she dresses like a pilgrim. Wednesday. Last night I was lying in bed and it hit me. I should go to for class clown. It's not like I'm known for being real funny at school or anything, but, I can, but if I can pull off one big prank right before folding, that could do it. Like putting a thumbtack on the teacher's chair. May. Thursday. Today I was trying to figure out how I was going to sneak a thumbtack onto Mr. Wolf's chair in history when he said something that made me rethink my plan. Mr. Wolf told me that he has a dentist appointment tomorrow, so we're going to have a substitute. Subs are like comic gold. You can say just about anything you want, and you can't get in trouble. Greg Hefley, will you please do this problem? Your mama, excuse me, your, your big fanny granny. Why, like, how do you think that? Yo, hot slap, happy grandpappy. Friday. I walked into my history class today, ready to execute my plan, but when I got to the door, guess who was the substitute teacher was? Hi, honey bunch bunches. Of all the people in the world to be our sub today, it was mom. I thought mom's days of getting involved at my school were awful. She used to be one of those parents who came in to help out in the classroom. But it all changed after mom volunteered to be a chaperone for our field trip to the zoo when I was in third grade. Mom, mom had prepared all sorts of material to help us kids appreciate the different exhibits. But, but all anybody wanted to do was watch the animals go to the bathroom. Anyway, mom totally foiled my plan to win class clown. And I'm just lucky there's not a category called the biggest mama's boy. Because after today, I'd ring that one in a landslide. You forgot your lunch at home, she said to me. Wednesday. The school people came out again today. I quit my job at school cartoonist after Creighton the Cretan, Curious Students came out. Creighton, Creighton the Curious Student. And I didn't really care who they picked to replace me. But everybody was laughing at the comic space at lunch. So I picked up a copy to see what was so funny, and when I opened it up, I could not believe my eyes. It was Zooey Mama, and of course Miss O'Rea didn't change the world of Rally Strip. Hey beautiful lady, do you want to go on a date with me? Uh, I'm not a lady, I'm just one of those dogs with long hair, so no thanks for that date. Zooey Mama! So now Rally's getting all the fame that was supposed to be mine. mine. Will you, will you put us in us in our, your comment? Will you put us in your comment? Sure. <laughs> Even the t-shirts are kissing Riley's butt. I almost lost my, I almost lost my lunch when Mr. Wolf dropped his chalk in history class. And he said, Zooey mama. Monday. This Zooey mama thing has got, really got me roped up. Raleigh's getting all the credit for a comment that we came up with together. 
I feel the least I could do is put my name on this strip as the co-creator. So I went up to Rally after school and told him that's what he was going to have to do. But Rally said Zooey Mama was all his idea and that I didn't have anything to do with it. I guess we must have been talking pretty loud because the next thing you know, we attracted a crowd. Fight! 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 The kids at my school are always itching to see a fight. Me and Rally tried to walk away, but those guys weren't going to let us go until they saw us throw some punches. I never been in a real fight before, so I didn't know how I was supposed to stand or hold my fist or anything. You can tell Rally didn't know what he was doing either, because he just started branching around like a leprechaun. I was pretty sure I could take Rally in a fight, but the thing that made me nervous was the fact that Rally takes karate. I don't know what kind of hocus pocus they teach in Rally's karate classes, but the last thing I needed w was for him to lay me out right there on the blacktop. Before me or Rally made a move, there was a screeching sound in the school parking lot. A bunch of teenagers had stopped a pickup truck and they started piling out. I was just happy that everybody's attention was on the teenagers except of me and Rally, but all the other kids took off and the teenagers started heading our way. But then I re realized that these teenagers looked awfully familiar. That's when it hit me. These were the same guys who chased me and Rally around on Halloween night. And they had finally ta caught up with us. But before we could make a run for it, we had our arms pinned behind our backs. Those guys wanted to keep teach us a lesson for taunting them on Halloween night. And they started arguing over what they sh should do with us. But to be honest with you, I was more concerned about something else. The cheese was only a few feet from where we were standing on the blacktop, and it was looking nastier than ever. The big teenager must have caught my eye, because the next thing I knew, he was looking at the cheese too. And I guess that gave him the idea he was looking for. Riley got singled out first. The big, the big kid grabbed Rally and grabbed him over to the cheese. Now, I don't want to say exactly what happened next, because if Rally ever tries to run for president and somebody finds out what these guys made him do, he won't have a chance. So, I'll put it to you this way. They made Rally blank, blank, blank the cheese. Cool. I knew they were going to make me do it too. I started to panic because I knew I wasn't going to be able to fight my way out of this situation. So I did some fast talking instead. I, I would, but I'm allergic to dairy. And believe it or not, it actually worked. You lucky punk. I know, I know. I guess the teenagers were satisfied to have made the point. Because after they made Rally finish off the rest of the cheese, they let us go. They got back in the truck and took off down the road. Me and Riley walked home together, but neither of us really said anything on the way back. I thought about me. I, I thought about mentioning to Riley that maybe he could have pulled out a couple of his karate moves back there, but something told me to hold off on that thought for now. Tuesday, at school today, the teachers let us outside after lunch. It took about 5 seconds for somebody to realize the cheese was missing from a spot on the blacktop. Hey. Everybody crowded around to look at where the cheese used to be. Nobody could believe it was actually gone. People started coming up with these crazy theories about what happened to it. Somebody said maybe the cheese grew legs and walked away. It took all my self-control to keep my mouth shut. And if Riley was standing right there, I honestly don't know if I could have kept quiet. A couple of the guys who were arguing over what happened to the cheese were the same ones who were egging me and Riley on yesterday afternoon. So I knew it wasn't going to be long before somebody put two and two together and figured out that we must have had something to do with it. Riley was starting to panic, and I don't blame him either. If the truth ever came out about how the cheese disappeared, Raleigh would be finished. He would have to move out of the state, and maybe even the country. That's when I decided to speak up. I told everybody that I knew what happened to the cheese. 
I said I was sick of it being on the blacktop, and I just decided to get rid of it once and for all. For a second though, it really just froze. I thought pe people were going to stop thanking me for what I did, but boy was I wrong. I really, I really wished I have worded my story a little differently, because if I threw away the cheese, guess what they, that meant? It meant that I had the cheese touch. June, Friday. Well, if Raleigh appreciated what I did for him last week, he hasn't said it. But we have started hanging out after school again, so I guess that means me and him are back to normal. And still the same with the Formula One racing. Diaper rash ahead! And he still falls to pieces. I can honestly say that so far, having the cheese touch haven't been all that bad. It got me out of doing the t squirrel dance unit in fifth ed because no one would partner up, partner up with me, and I've had that the whole lunch table to myself every day. Today was the last day of school, and they handed out yearbooks after eighth period. I flipped to the class favorites page, and here was the picture that was waiting for me: class clown. I wanted it to be me, but it said Rally Jefferson. I, all I can say is, if anybody ever wants a free yearbook, they can dig one out of the trash can in the back of the cafeteria. You know, Riley can have the class clown for I kill, but if he ever gets too big for his britches, I'll just remind him that he was the guy who ate the blank, 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 blank. The end.